Well, Nick Fatia, adjunct professor at USC, author of The Bitcoin Lair and author of the best-selling book, Layered Money. It is so great to have you on the show. Welcome. Thanks, Julia. I appreciate it. Well, Nick, we've known each other for a little while now since your book came out, but just for the folks, um, would love for you to kind of introduce yourself and a bit about your background and how you got into this space. Sure. So my background is in fixed income investment management. I'm a former bond trader and rates analyst and strategist. Uh, I was working in the fixed income industry for many years on the institutional side. So uh, we call that the buy side. This is where big institutional money uh, hires managers like uh, people know PIMCO, for example, one of our competitors uh, when I was on the desk. So these are big managers that take institutional capital and invest in bonds. And their goal is mostly mostly the preservation of capital. And uh, with uh, an ancillary goal of generating return and uh, seeking uh, outperformance versus its benchmarks. So that's the industry I come from. I was on the rates desk trading. I started trading money markets, moved on to trading U.S. Treasuries and the whole rate space, including the euro dollar curve and uh, even European bonds and futures. And then I, while I was on the desk and, you know, really coming into my own as a macro strategist and someone who's watching the Fed all the time, I discovered Bitcoin in 2016. And so that's when my career took a little bit of a turn. I was still focused on building out my money markets and rates expertise, but at the same time falling down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. So in 2019, I made a jump from the rates desk to more of an educator role where my goal was to educate people about Bitcoin with the backdrop of the bond market and global macro in the world I come from, traditional finance, uh, as well as teaching. So I had the opportunity to take an adjunct position at USC Marshall School of Business. I teach fixed income over there uh, and I've, I've taught it for four years now, and I'm going into my first year of a brand new class based off of my book and my theories about Bitcoin and its place in the financial system of the future. And that class is called Bitcoin and Digital Assets. And so that'll uh, be starting in January. Uh, and then, of course, last year I started the Bitcoin Layer, which is my research publication. It's now also a YouTube channel. This is where uh, everybody can come for global macro focused Bitcoin research analysis and education. That's awesome. Um, just real quick on the teaching front. Um, tell me like how that ha- like how did you get into teaching? And then also, it's really cool because uh, you'll be pioneering this course. I haven't heard of I mean, I don't know if other universities have a similar type of course. I know it's based on your book, but just kind of share a bit more about the teaching part of things. Sure. So um Somebody that you and I know uh, mutually, uh, when I was on the desk, I, you know, this person said, hey, you know, I've been offered a guest lecture spot at USC, but I think it's more for you than, than it is for me. And uh, he, you know, he kind of put me up for it. And I uh, grabbed a beer with um, an adjunct professor at USC who was doing some recruiting for guest lectures for the fixed income class and the hedge funds class. I had worked at a hedge fund. I was at a fixed income manager at the time. And so I fit the bill for a guest lecture for this uh, tenured fixed income bond professor at USC. And I came in with uh, a couple lectures about um, long duration investment management. This is in the industry, we call it ALM, which is asset liability matching or asset liability management. Uh, It's also called LDI, and this is liability-driven investing. So people would know this as the insurance industry having a need for 30 and 50-year fixed income instruments. This is a concept that isn't really finance 101. So when I came in and I gave gave a few lectures on these topics, including demographics, uh, the students pegged me um, with the old, old people need 30s. Guy, uh, guy title, um, you know, talking about retirees needing 30 year bonds. And um, anyway, I gave a few guest lectures over there. And the, the professor basically said, 
I would love to grandfather you my fixed income course as I pursue research elsewhere. And so um, through that process, I became an adjunct professor at USC, taught it for a few years. I've taught that class for a few years now. And then last year, the Dean of Marshall School of Business uh, was given my book by one of the my fellow professors at USC. And uh, he and I had a conversation and he said, I would love for you to teach Bitcoin in our new digital assets initiative, which is in part uh, sponsored and funded by the Van Eck family through their family of ETFs and um, the wealth that they've built through those channels. They are pursuing a Bitcoin ETF over at the Van Eck um, ETF operation. So they made a donation to USC and my class is now part of the business school uh, at USC. There are, I will mention, there are courses across the country that are teaching Bitcoin and some of them are called crypto, some of them are called blockchain, some of them cryptocurrency. But this is, to my awareness, the first course of its type to teach Bitcoin as an, as an asset with a place in the global macro investment landscape, as well as teaching uh, valuation metrics based off of Bitcoin data that includes on-chain metrics, mining data, and uh, we're also going to be teach li teaching Lightning Network, but from a capital market perspective. And so a lot of these are my ideas that I've written about over the years and um, are quite Bitcoin native ideas. Not that I'm the originator of valuing Bitcoin with mining metrics like hash rate um, or anything of the sort, but I do believe it's the first or maybe one of the first courses that will be taught about Bitcoin, Bitcoin valuation, Lightning Network in a business school setting in the yeah. country. Tell me about like how um, young people's students are kind of embracing this. I'd love to, I mean, you're on the ground. You used to talk to them all the time. Like, what are you hearing from students as it relates to Bitcoin or crypto? Students are, students understand trends, like young people understand trends. So for example, we have social networking apps. So when I was in college, Facebook just was launched. And then I think in my second or third year, I started to hear about Twitter. And so the, the youth follows the trend. And right now the youth is um, leaving Instagram, for example, and going to TikTok. That's what the numbers are telling us. And so part, I mentioned these social network apps because part of the youth adopting technologies uh, is their relationship with money. So young people use Venmo as one of their primary ways of uh, using money. And Bitcoin and cryptocurrency in general, and that, any, that even includes this new wave of NFTs, which is minuscule, but it's part of this ecosystem. All of these things are, the students are aware, the young people are aware that this is clearly the future. It's like when, you dis when people generally discover Bitcoin, they sense this uh, future built technology that is a huge advance from traditional. So if anybody were to send a bank wire and then go send a Bitcoin transaction, the difference is night and day, they will be able to see uh, the advantages and disadvantages. It's very similar to going to the post office and actually mailing a letter versus sending an email. The difference is night and day. So with Bitcoin, the technology, once, once young people use it, they are convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that this has a place in society and will for many years to come. They understand all of that fundamentally, but in terms of what is Bitcoin, what is the difference between Bitcoin and the rest of crypto? What about monetary history? Like the subject of layered money is looking at a thousand years of gold, dollars, credit money, and financial systems. All of those things, it's just as anybody else in the world that you'll see that only a few a small percentage of the population is 
financially literate and in terms of monetary systems, credit money, the difference between gold, dollars, and you know, fiat money is the term that is more colloquial. All of those concepts, I feel that students are, are just uh, about the same as the rest of the populace. But in terms of trying to convince them that Bitcoin is the future, you don't need to do that. Um, maybe that what the difference is between Bitcoin and the rest of crypto, they need education on that. But in terms of new technology replacing old technology when it comes to money, they are they are well aware and don't need any convincing there. Yeah. You know what's great about your book is just that you dive in, like you said, thousand years of monetary history. Like I read your book. I did the audio book version of it, um, which is an amazing, it's, it's just like, it's actually really quick and awesome to listen to. And there are many things that surprised me that I just didn't know about, or I frankly, like never even thought about as it relates to money. And so I guess like for you in, in that process, what did, what did you learn or like what, what surprised you the most, I guess, in your going through in your research of even writing this book, what were some of the kind of uh, more illuminating parts for you as it relates to like our monetary history and maybe some of the things that people should know about? Yeah, there were a lot of things that I learned while researching the book. And yes, the audio book is under five hours. It's a quick listen. And people have really enjoyed that version uh, read by Guy Swan. So thank you for uh, mentioning that. But yes, I learned so much about monetary history, especially the part from the, thir the 13th century to about the 17th, 18th century, just going to Europe and learning about how credit money came about to be used across the continent, how discounting and money markets were really invented in 15th century, 16th century Antwerp. Uh, those were, those things were really fascinating to me. It really, what it explained to me is that credit money is an inherent, uh, it's an inherent characteristic of what our society chooses to use. Basically, I believe that people will always be willing to accept the promise in lieu of the asset if there is some convenience attached to it. And so that, that's the basic idea of a gold coin versus a gold certificate that promises to pay the gold coin. The piece of paper is easier to carry around and easier to use, easier to send across, um, let's say, land or sea. And the coin is, doesn't have any counterparty risk, and, um, but it's, it's inconvenient to hold because it is heavy. And it's, it's very valuable, so you're always a target. These pros and cons to what I call first layer money and second layer money, or people will understand them as assets and liabilities, this hierarchy of money is part of our species and the way that we deal with money. Credit has always been something that has been accepted at its face value because we have this tendency to establish trust systems, systems of trust. The dollar and the banking system and the Fed is all a trust system and it's not linked to gold anymore. It used to be, and that is more recent history. I think more people that are familiar with Bitcoin will understand that gold and the dollar delinked in the early 70s. So we're only uh, about 50 years into this experiment of non-gold linked government money. But the history also tells us that this experiment that we're in has characteristics that we can trace back a thousand years. Can you, let's explore that a bit about the characteristics that we can trace back. Let's tease that out. So it really, um, you know, when I'm looking at, uh, I give an example of an English goldsmith in, let's say, the 16th century. This goldsmith was actually also the, the uh, preeminent banker in England at the time because he had the best vaults and he had the best method for keeping the gold away from thieves on an overnight basis. 
And because he was the best at that, he issued deposits that were pieces of paper that said, I, English goldsmith of the year 1500, promised to pay the bearer of this certificate one gold coin that's stored in my vault on demand. And that gold certificate did end up circulating in society as money. So that's a 500 year old example of how gold was used in a paper form with trust. And that there were systems built around that type of activity. That's one uh, fictitious example I'm giving of uh, that's related to many real life examples that I read about when I was doing this research. These types of goldsmiths were the bankers of the era and their certificates circulated as money in society. So how is that any different than in the year 1900, the United States Treasury issuing $10 silver certificates that are, that are promises to pay a $10 silver coin on demand um, to, to whoever the bearer is of that paper. They're, they're not different really in any way when we're just looking at assets, liabilities, and counterparties. And so that is evidence to me that human beings tend to trust paper money. Now it's digital in digital form. It's not paper anymore. Um, some parts, parts of the world are still using paper. So these examples are important to hold on to in order to educate the entire world, not just uh, you know the USA where cash is mostly disappearing from uh, our daily transactions. Mm-hmm. It was interesting too in the book, like just kind of like the rise and decline of different currencies that um, you looked at and um, you brought up this idea of trust. So let's talk about now, like with the US dollar, like how do you view the US dollar? Um, do you think that it's broken? Like what are your views there? Yes. Yeah, so the, in, the US dollar is, a, again, a credit money system. It's built off of trust. It's not linked to the uh, precious metal system anymore and hasn't been for 50 years officially and unofficially much longer. The, the era between the founding of the Fed, 1913, the Great Depression and uh, the 30s, that pe- between that period and the 70s, gold was being removed from the system. So it was a slow and steady process. And then in 2007, August of 2007, something I write about in the book, the Euro dollar system, which is the offshore system of the US dollar currency that's issued by historically European banks and now banks all over the world, that system broke down in terms of its, in terms of its protection and, or its sanctity from the rest of the onshore US dollar system. Basically, the fact that this system had run um, out of control, it showed itself to the market in August of 2007. That is when uh, we see in the capital markets, the LIBOR, the spread of LIBOR to Fed funds separate for the first time meaningfully. And now it is our metric for financial crisis. It's the spread between the offshore and the onshore system in terms of dollar risk. So that broken system that uh, broke for the first time in August two, 2007, it is still broken today and it is guaranteed by the Fed where in the past they hadn't. So in December of 2007, four months after the system broke, the Fed came in and instituted a foreign exchange swap line with the European Central Bank, basically in order to backstop European banks that had lent dollars into existence outside of the Federal Reserve system. So this backdoor bailout of European banks through the foreign exchange swap line in December of 07, which is, was four months after the break in August of 07, that is my framework for the dollar. It is a post-August 07 dollar in which the Fed has basically become the lender of only resort for the entire world's banking system. 
And that, and I do mean the entire world because the European banks are where the outsized amount of bad dollar loans that are called Euro dollars, meaning they're dollars issued in Europe or outside of the US, outside of the Federal Reserve jurisdiction banking system. So that is the state of our dollar system. It's a broken one that is, uh, has a permanent bailout on it by the Fed. The permanent bailout is working in that the dollar isn't dying. It's actually rallying relative to all other uh, government currencies. And as the dollar really, uh, I believe in the dollar wrecking ball theory, which is this uh, theory that weaker currencies will succumb to the dollar because the dollar is the system to fund debt around the world. And the world is dependent on dollar funding, which is also known as Euro dollar funding because it comes from banks that are non-US based. And that whole system is truly embedded. So I don't think we are headed for the death of the dollar, especially versus other currencies like the Euro, the Chinese Yuan, or pick any other currency especially emerging market currencies, the dollar will remain king dollar for decades to come. And um, it is a system that is so deeply embedded in the way that the whole world operates in terms of trade and international finance um, that I just, I do believe the dollar is here to stay for a very long time. And my beliefs about Bitcoin are that it comes in as a parallel system and not here to break uh, the dollar in any, in any uh, near term time horizon. Uh, I believe in a coexistence of the dollar system and Bitcoin uh, because Bitcoin is more of an asset uh, today than it is uh, a monetary system um, because you can't create credit out of uh, the Bitcoin system as it, as it stands today. And so for those reasons, the two coexist. They're not quite comparable. Um, I believe Bitcoin is more comparable to other asset classes like equities, real estate, and fixed income even. Um, and then of course, gold and other commodities. And the dollar is more of a denomination. It's a broken one. It's a broken one that is going on 15 years running of being broken. And so it's not the most comparable uh, comparison. I wrote about this on my Substack publication, the Bitcoin layer, um, that the dollar and and Bitcoin isn't, it's not the best juxtaposition. It's, it's, not, it's not one versus the other. It sounds like they can be parallel. Um, I'm, I am interested in this idea of like the dollar being like broken. It's kind of like a new frame, like you said, post 07 dollar. Um, Maybe for like maybe more of the lay person, um, and I would definitely count myself in that camp because I'm not a macro expert. Like, what does this mean for them, or why, why does this matter uh, to them? So, um, when you mean them, are you talking uh, about you know, the Fed, for example, or um, or or you're talking about just a people uh, that? Just- like you every know, maybe like Americans, every, yeah, everyday people, like everyday Americans, like even like my parents yep. uh, who watch or yep. listen. What does it mean right. for them? So, so uh, for people that have checking accounts, let's say in the United States, um, they uh, up to $250,000, their checking account is guaranteed by the federal government through the FDIC mechanism. This was instituted in the early 30s when banks basically uh, collapsed post 1929 great crash. And um, the government basically said that we believe that people should not fear their checking account sanctity. Uh, they should have this insurance fund that basically they're, they know that their dollars are safe. Uh, beyond that, people are wise to invest in securities like money market funds, for example, which own US treasuries. These are securities or other short-term fixed income assets. Um, and, and of course, equities as well. All of these things are not necessarily affected by the euro dollar. This is an onshore system. You either have deposits with a uh, guaranteed bank or you have securities that can fluctuate in price um, up or down. But you know, if you have money market securities, your money is in theory safe because it owns high grade quality instruments. 
Gotcha. However, when we step outside of that onshore universe and we look at dollars that are being issued around the world, let's say, um, let's say that a Brazilian company borrows a billion dollars from a German bank. Uh, that money that's issued by the bank, the bank of Germ- uh, the German bank, doesn't have to reserve those dollars against anything based off of the Fed's uh, reserve requirements. It basically can issue a billion dollars and create that money out of out of nothing. Now, now this is where it starts to get um, the euro dollar system starts to affect everyday people because now you have it's it's north of 10 trillion maybe even 15 trillion or more of dollars circulating around the world digitally or on ledgers that is outside of what the fed has governed as the onshore dollar system and when if and when those borrowing counterparties default on their debt then it puts the german bank in jeopardy because they've lent the money. And then the German bank has to get bailed out by the ECB, but the ECB doesn't have dollars. So the ECB has to print euros, pledge them as collateral to the Fed, borrow dollars from the Fed, and then issue those dollars to the German bank. And now you have a system that basically there's no accountability for the quantity of dollars. And that's how it affects everyday people is that the dollar system is fragile and infinite. There is no scarcity to the dollar in any way. And not only is there no scarcity where we, we can see bad loans happening outside of the U.S., but now those bad loans are guaranteed by the Fed because the Fed can't let the German bank go under because it'll crater the whole financial system. Um, and we can see that based, you know, all the way tracking back to 07, 08, and 09, the Fed was focused on interbank risk and making sure that interbank risk didn't go haywire because if one bank goes down with a lot of interbank risk, that means other banks will go down. And so that's why while Lehman failed, they bailed out City, JP, um, I'm sorry, City, Goldman, Morgan Stanley. And, uh, and many other financial inst- institutions. Deutsche Bank and uh, European banks, Barclays, got massive bailouts through the foreign exchange swap line mechanisms uh, as well. So how does it affect normal people is what your question is. It affects them because they need to understand that the dollar is not this pure onshore protected and scarce, even if it's fractionally reserved system. It's actually infinite in the ability to issue it because now, and it's because the Fed has promised to essentially bail out the world. And so when we see, when we see capital flee the, um, the dollar fixed uh, components, like let's say short-term fixed income, and go into real estate or equities, that is investors saying, I don't want to roll my dollars over at low interest rates because I don't have any confidence in the scarcity of dollars. I need to own assets and assets that can't be created out of nothing. And that's real estate, that's equities, that's commodities, that's Bitcoin, including you know, gold and Bitcoin. And so people are seeking protection from the broken dollar system in the form of assets. So when you look at real estate prices over the last 15 years and, you know, after the crash, of course, of 07, 08, in terms of real estate, they bottomed in 09. They've gone one way up since then. So have stocks. Stocks have gone up. Let's say we were at uh, 600 handle in the S&P. We're at 4,000 today. So stocks have gone up six to seven times since the March 09 low. Um, Real estate has doubled or tripled around the country uh, during that time. 
That is because of this dynamic, right? I, it's very hard to explicitly prove it in a first order effect. But when you step back and you look at what is happening, you're able to draw these connections. And that's what I tried to do a little bit with layered money. I try to do that with the Bitcoin layer as well, where I explain the role of the broken Euro dollar system in all of what, um, you know, the asset prices that we're seeing. And um, there's just a lot to unpack with the broken dollar system, but the price is the truth. So look at asset prices off of the 07 to 09 cycle, and you have to start to draw certain conclusions. One of my conclusions that I've drawn is that the denomination is broken. So investors need to seek protection in assets. Yeah. Well, that was a great explanation. I would, I would definitely take your class if I were a student at USC, because I haven't heard anyone explain it like you just did, Nick. Um, let's talk about inflation. So we had the C- we're, As we were recording this, we had the CPI uh, print that came in today, hotter than expected uh, for the month of August. So um, would love to kind of just get your views on inflation. And also, you know, we have the Fed as well, um, and the meeting coming up uh, in sep- later this month. So what are your kind of views as it relates to those topics? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, this is an ever-changing topic, uh, something that I'm covering, but I've, fi- I've found myself uh, changing my analysis as the market keeps adjusting. I believe that, first of all, I believe that the economy is in contraction. Whether or not people are calling it a recession really doesn't um, matter that much. The bottom line is that uh, economic activity is definitely in slowdown mode. Higher interest rates uh, have definitely choked off real estate activity, consumer activity. We've seen that from the data. So as the, as the slowdown happens, I believe that the Fed is not going to pivot and start cutting rates, but that they will pause and let the market digest these uh, higher interest rates and let you know the economy go through this or try to attempt the soft landing is what the Fed wants. So for that, for those reasons, I've been uh, writing about how I believe that we're heading for a pause sometime t- sometime soon. Now with inflation still at uh, you know above eight percent on the on the annual. I was looking for a second uh, or the first true monthly decline in inflation. We didn't get that. We still see core inflation going up at six tenths of a percent month over month. All of that is to say that inflation is still running very hot. There are marginal slowdowns, right? Uh, We went from 9.1% year over year inflation. Uh, Now we're down to about 8.3% a year over year inflation. So there is some moderation in inflation, but we're still above eight. The Fed's goal is two. And even if they move that goal and say, you know, maybe two to 3% or something like that, we are still a mile and a half away from uh, the Fed's goal on inflation. So what does that mean for monetary policy? Tighter, tighter, tighter. And so right now the Fed's upper bound is at two and a half percent. Next week, they will raise that to three and a quarter percent. But you see how quickly markets are changing. Up until last week, when we had this Wall Street Journal uh, leak, basically the Fed is now communicating what it's going to do through the Wall Street Journal um, a few days or a week or two ahead of time. We got the leak that Fed is going to go 75. Okay, up until that point, the market was still trading 60 something basis points, meaning it wasn't sure if it was going to be 50 or 75. Then the Wall Street Journal leak, then the market moves to 75. Then we get the uh, CPI this morning, and the market is now pricing in a 25% chance of a 100 basis point rate hike next week. So the market is moving fast, and the Fed isn't sending out anybody to say, hey, we're going to pause soon. And so the absence of any pause rhetoric and the Jackson Hole speech a couple of weeks ago really uh, locked this in. The Fed wants to bring it down 
no matter what. And so we, sh we would be fools to discount right now what the Fed says they're going to do over the next couple meetings. Now, anything can happen by December. We're only in September. Um, anything can happen by December, but clearly nothing was going to happen to change next week's hike. It doesn't look like anything is going to change to affect November's hike now either. So we will continue at the Bitcoin layer. We will continue to watch the data. I do believe that the economy is slowing and the Fed will have to pause its hikes. But I also believe that when it gets to the pause, it'll keep it there for a long time. This idea that we're going to get QE soon or rate cut soon is, is nonsense. It's that is not at, at the front of anybody's tongue because we're not even getting them talking about the pause, let alone cuts, let alone QT, uh, QE. We're still in aggressive QT, balance sheet uh, unwind. The Fed might even go out and sell mortgage backed securities that would put pressure on volatility and other asset classes. All of these things are in play right now um, as the Fed is basically not giving any indication that uh, we're in for a pause. So rates are adjusting. We see two-year yields north of three and three quarters percent now. Uh, they, could, they could get to a four handle very easily as uh, the two-year yield is a extrapolation of Fed funds over the next two years. And so uh, the 10-year yield is really what, you know, now that's where my eyes are. And this inversion in the yield curve as it gets deeper if the th if the ten year yield goes above three and a half percent and starts to march towards four percent, then uh, it could get messy in risk. I that my base case is still not that right now. Tens are trading at three forty two. The high for the year was three fifty. We saw that in June. Uh, we should get a retest to here of that three fifty area, and we're getting it right now as we speak. Um, if this level holds, then I believe that the inversion will get deeper. That will put pressure on the Fed to pause. The Fed will pause, and then we'll get a steepening of the curve where um, the, the, the deep inversion uh, unwinds itself as the market starts to correct. The inversion is the policy error, right? Policy error means Fed hiking in a slowdown. 10-year yields coming down relative to two-year yields as Two-year yields reflect monetary policy tightening, and 10-year yields reflect a slower economy. So that inversion, that deep inversion, will reverse course when the Fed announces its pause. But again, that's not what we're looking at right now. So all eyes on the data, inflation data. We get producer inflation tomorrow. We get uh, consumer sentiment inflation expectations on Friday with University of Michigan. Um, and then again, data, 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 we'll be watching everything at the Bitcoin layer. Yeah. Just um, another real quick follow on though, with the Fed's goal, uh, obviously inflation still running very hot uh, above 8% or eight, above eight and their goal is two. Is that a reasonable goal to still have, or do they need to just adjust their expectations for a different kind of goal? Yeah, they, um, it, it's going to be a moving target for them. 2% is not a reasonable goal in terms of policy because you, you're going to cause uh, a depression if you take rates to 5%. It just, it mathematically can't work. That's the other side of this ball game is that when you raise rates, the treasury starts to pay outsized amount of interest expense. Um, the economy starts to shut down because corporates can't borrow. Um, high yield uh, gets shut out of the market. The bond market starts stops operating in terms of new issuance. All of that stuff starts to break if the Fed keeps raising rates. And those are all reasons I feel like we're in for a pause. If they actually want to get inflation down to 2% by next year, they could do it by you know, killing every component of the economy. And so- and that's not my expectation. I believe that once, you know, basically um, what you're asking, Julia, is that once they see inflation go down seven, six, five, four, they'll get super relaxed and let it play out. 
and not be, you know, trying to, even though it's gone from eight to four, rate, keep raising rates. You won't see the Fed raise rates again, going from eight to 4% inflation. They'll let it come down. They'll, and then once they, once they see where it can't get below, then they'll adjust their inflation uh, goal and they'll say, okay, it's 3%. We would be happy at 3% or something like that. But that's really next year's business. Um, for now, they're going to say, you know, 2% is a long way away. We got to tighten. Um, and it, it is quite dramatic. And as a rates, uh, as a rates analyst and researcher, this is uh, very exciting times as the Fed is um, coming to some sort of shift. And then it'll get boring again once the Fed pauses, because I do believe that the pause will be for a long time and the economy will have to, uh, you know, muddle through. Yeah, exciting times and really dynamic times. And I bet an interesting time to be one of your students right now. I'm sure your classes are probably, maybe they're talking about these exact topics. I don't know. But Nick, I really appreciate you. And, um, you know, real quick, like let folks know where they can find you or learn more or subscribe or pick up your book. Absolutely. Uh, you guys can find everything at thebitcoinlayer.com. So that's our Substack publication, our YouTube channel, our socials. We're now on Twitter, Instagram. We have a great uh, daily one minute show uh, with global macro and Bitcoin highlights that hits uh, the socials every morning. And then people can find my book on Amazon or Audible, Layered Money, uh, layeredmoney.com also to links of the uh, international versions that we have uh, across the world. Um, lots of them in, in Europe. The Spanish one is doing great. Uh, excited to see people tweet pictures about the uh, Del Oro al Bitcoin from uh, across the pond. And uh, so, yeah, the BitcoinLayer.com. Find everything that we're doing over there. Well, Nick Batia, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you so much. Thanks, Julia. Take care.